Good evening, everyone. This is a great crowd tonight. Uh, welcome to the Nan Tucker McAvoy Auditorium. I'm Nicholas Bell, curator at the Renwick Gallery, and I am absolutely thrilled to introduce one of the most significant artists working in glass today, Karen Lamont. Karen is a native of New York City and graduated from RISD in 1990, uh, where she studied sculpture, glass, and printmaking, probably unaware, I think, uh, that those disparate fields would actually be combined by her work. Uh, a decade of blown glass gave way in 1999 to a new idea, expressed with this deceivingly simple statement. I wanted to make a life-size hollow cast glass dress. <laughs> I knew the piece would be very technically complicated, and since the world-renowned center for large-scale casting is the Czech Republic, I decided to pack my bags and go for it. And she did later that year with the help of a Fulbright scholarship. Now, I say this was deceivingly simple because, of course, no one had ever done this before. And when she arrived in Prague, Karen was politely told it was quite impossible. What she's about to show you is all evidence to the contrary. That we are here today speaks to Karen's patience, remarkable ability to sculpt the most achingly beautiful, mysterious, haunting uh, objects in the most unlikely process. On your way in, you may have seen one of these being prepared for tomorrow night's party. This fall, the American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery acquired Karen's reclining dress impression with drapery through the extraordinary generosity of the James Renwick Alliance and Colleen and John Catelli, who are here with us tonight. It serves as the theme for our annual gala, Outrageous, with an exclamation point, uh, held tomorrow in the Kogod Courtyard upstairs. And I encourage all of you to attend. There are tickets available, and they will be sold at the door. Funds raised from this event directly support free programs at the museum. If you want to hear more about Karen's work and the role of fashion in art, I will be moderating a conversation over dinner tomorrow night with Karen and with Project Runway's Nick Ferrios. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we are recording the lecture this evening, and it will be uploaded to the museum's website, americanart.si.edu, at a later date. Uh, to make sure we get all of your questions, please use the microphone stationed in the middle of the auditorium. Uh, when Karen takes questions at the end. Uh, please also silence your cell phones. Uh, and uh, there was a question about photography. You can take pictures, but please no flash. So with that, please welcome me and uh, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Karen Lamont. Okay. I had several working titles for tonight's talk, um, and my favorite was How to Make a Cast Glass in 3,724 Easy-to-Follow Steps. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, I will talk about my studio practice, but I also want to touch upon the thinking behind my work and show you some images from several different exhibitions I've had. Then I will end the talk with um, sharing some experiences I had doing research for a new body of work and a few sneak preview images of upcoming attractions. So here we go. My adventures in cast glass began in 1999. I went to the Czech Republic on a Fulbright grant. My work in the Czech Republic was to be a student at the Applied Arts Academy and to try and make my first dress at a glass casting factory about an hour outside of the city. I'm a native New Yorker. I thought I was from the most beautiful city in the world. But when I moved to Prague, I was stunned by the architectural sculptures on the outside of buildings. The, detail, the details were fantastic. All of this drapery and flamboyance. Um, and these buildings were on my daily walk to and from the academy. And I believe that these new surroundings greatly influenced the development of my work. But first, the factory. And the factory is where I learned how to speak Czech. So, um, I think it would be the equivalent of speaking English like a longshoreman. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty rude. <laughs> but uh, my first word, catastrophe. Uh, <laughs> it means catastrophe. 
And that's what they said when I appeared with my wax. Um, so you can imagine I was pretty angry um, and heartbroken. Um, so why was my piece such a catastrophe? Um, I could see in the surrounding environment of the factory, they had all the equipment to do what I wanted to do. And lost wax casting is a 5,000 year old process. So what was the problem? Um, In understanding what they saw as the problem, I, I understood the history of the factory. It was started under communism, completely funded by the communist government. So I call it sort of the one good thing to come out of communism. Um, and the idea behind it was to explore cast glass as an architectural component. That means they were prepared to make quite large architectonic shapes. They were not ready for texture, detailing, all of the things that I was going for. Um, and they had never used wax as a material for a positive before. So um, I decided to kind of apply my charms and talk them into it. It was successful. It took the full year. Um, but this is the first piece I made titled Vestige. You may notice that there is no absent figure on the inside of this piece. Um, and as always the case, the minute I saw the, the finished piece, I knew that I wanted the interior space to be the absence of the human body. But the big question was how to do that. This is the first piece I was able to cast with the absent body. Um, people always ask, did you think of that yourself? Um, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> I did think of it myself and I kind of made up the entire process um, in, in you know, trial and error. You know, that's the only way to do it. And um, so I thought we would walk through the process as it stands today. I start with live models and take molds directly off of the bodies. This is because I want a very realistic effect in the finished sculpture. From the mold, from the plaster mold, I make a rubber positive. And the rubber captures every detail. Often in the studio, it's quite cold, so the models are covered with goosebumps. <laughs> to preserve these details, I transfer them to the inside of a wax shell by painting molten wax directly on this rubber body. Um, the wax shell needs to be about two, two and a half centimeters thick, which is about an inch. Then I start with my creative process. Um, I see dresses as a palette. Clothing to me is an unspoken language of a society. And I work with this visual vocabulary on demand. I have over 400 dresses in my studio. And I often cut them up and reassemble them. I start composing with the dress on the surface of the wax. We use clothing to conceal our bodies in a practical manner, but also obscure and protect our individual personalities. We simultaneously use it to project a public personality. And that's where my interest is, is this interplay between the inner layer of the body the, the individual, and the exterior layer of the clothing, which is the society. Once the composition of the object is complete, I start the unbelievably laborious process of rendering it in glass. I work with stiffeners and then wax to preserve every detail. Um, in these sculptures, I believe it's the stitching and the warp and weft of the cloth and all of these sort of micro details that create a sense of reality and a direct relationship with the viewer who comes upon the sculpture. I have little rules. Because I'm looking at an individual defined by society, I cut away the body where it is not in contact with either the dress or the fabric. Um, and to me, that becomes a metaphor for the individual defined by the society in which it lives. 
Here you can see the detailed impression of the hand in contact with the drapery on the outside. Now, we go back to the factory. These guys are ready for me at this point. Um, <laughs> things have started to go a lot more smoothly. Um, and so we look at the wax together, see if there's any small modifications that need to be made, and then start building the mold. The scale of my work requires that I actually work in an industrial facility to make it. Here we are building a wooden construction to hold the liquid plaster mold material. The mold material is a combination of plaster and silica, and in its liquid form, it flows over the wax and takes on all of those details that I've worked so hard to preserve in my studio. So after about two months of work, um, this is my prize. It's a 500-pound block of plaster. <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> On the interior, that's actually the real prize, um, it, the wax positive is invested there. Now here comes the, what was the catastrophe, which is uh, getting the wax out of the mold. They had never worked with wax, so they saw it as an impossible task. Um, so what I did with my husband Steve, we went to the local hardware store and got two pressure cookers, which are called papignacs. And <laughs> it's my favorite check word. Um, and just attached rubber hoses and blew steam up into the molds, melting the wax out. We stayed up all night refilling these pots, but we were successful. So the wax is lost. And here's the mold. So you can see the two layers that I was talking about, that vulnerable interior, the body and that protective exterior, the clothing. After the molds dry for several weeks, they're loaded into the oven. But at this point, in case you haven't figured it out, I want to point out that I am the only woman for miles. Um, and it has occurred to me that it's really humorous and ironic that my highly feminine dresses in cast glass are made working with a team of burly Czech men. Um, but it's pretty fun. I think they like it. Looking from the inside of the oven, now the molds are in the oven, it's clear that the scale that I'm working on is really on the limits of the, what's available in terms of technology today. And my work is kiln cast, so that's different from hot casting, and this is the difference. The cold glass is loaded into the molds, and then the entire oven is brought up to the melting temperature of the glass. The glass folds, flows down into that cavity, and you have cast glass. So now we're at my least favorite part of the, of the process, and it's called annealing. That door gets shut for 80 days. Yeah. Um, and the problem is that you really don't know until the end of the 80 days if the casting is successful or not. Um, and this very slow cooling process is called annealing. Now, when the door opens, it's like Christmas. I'm so thrilled, usually thrilled. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm really disappointed. Um, and that's because at certain points, um, the success or the failure rate, whichever you want to call it, is 50%. So that means losing half of everything that I make. Um, and that hurts. <laughs> but when it works out, it's fantastic. And here, um, I stay very involved with all steps in the process because the Czech tradition is of these very smooth and beautiful surfaces. But what I'm going for is completely different. Um, I want all of those little details of the, you know, of the wax that I brought them. And so I stick around and make sure that everything is going well. That guy was missing those two fingers when I got to the factory. That was not, <laughs> that was not because of me. <laughs> he made a mistake. Um, 
So um, stacking the pieces, all of the manipulation of the, the final thing gives me a heart attack because um, you know, this has become quite precious by this moment. Um, so just to recap, here's a reminder of the mold ready to go into the oven and then the, class, the glass piece coming out. The very detailed wax impression of the hand and the fabric on the other side. So finally, nine months later, a cast glass dress. And um, sometimes I say to myself, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> because it's an awful lot of work to go through to make a sculpture. Um, but I think the fact that I'm pretty obsessive and compulsive has a lot to do with the answer. But um, the other part is transparency. And there's this sort of non-material quality to cast glass that allows me visually to work with both this exterior and interior surface at the same time. And I think that's an opportunity that doesn't exist with any other materials, at least that I know of. So, where does the present work with dresses come from? In my early work, I was completely in love with marionettes and puppets. Um, I knew I wanted to work figuratively, but I didn't want to work literally with the figure. Um, so I found this as a way of working abstractly. And this is a piece from a series of marionettes that were based on the seven deadly sins. Um, and I like that because it offered a little something for everyone. Um, and this, this is sloth. And you can see I exaggerated the hands and because I wanted to create a very heavy feeling like that it was so much effort just to move those hands. Now here's uh, one of my first puppets. It's literally one of the first puppets I made, and that's why it looks so twisted up. Um, but what I did was I, um, in my research on the marionettes, I brought home a book from a children's library on how to make puppets from felt. And I took the book into the hot shop, and I sat at the glass blowing bench, and I just followed the instructions. So um, you know, I cut the arms and did all the adding, but using hot glass maneuvers instead of sewing. Mm -hmm. Um, and as my skills got better, I was able to be, sort of become more intricate. And um, I finally became obsessed with Italian, Italian filigree techniques because to me it looked like the weave of cloth that flattened, you know, the, the spun, spun rod looked like the warp and weft of the cloth. Then I said to myself, well, if you're actually just interested in cloth, then you should stop it with the puppets. And um, so I made, <laughs> I made a series of small clotheslines. And this was the last one. And when I saw the dress on the end, I was like, I should make a dress. And I should make it full scale. And uh, I should make it in the Czech Republic. So that started that adventure. OK. So from the time of where I started in 1999 until about 2004, I worked incredibly intensively at the Czech factory. Um, I was developing my vocabulary in cast glass and um, really creating strong working relationships with the guys at the factory. And at the end of 2004, I was invited to have an exhibition at the Czech Museum of Fine Arts in the Romanesque basement. I titled the show Vanitas, and in Latin that literally means emptiness, but it suggests untruthfulness or futility. I was inspired by the literal emptiness of the dresses and the absent viewers in the mirrors. But I also wanted to comment on the changes I had been observing in post-communist Czech society. I had the rare opportunity to watch a culture in massive transition. And I observed people thriving with newfound freedoms, but the society was being overtaken with this sort of bonfire of the vanities. I called these sculptures lark mirrors, 
And literally, a lark mirror is a small piece of glass dangled over a net to attract and capture a small bird. But the phrase has come to mean a fatally attractive illusion. In my mind, the mirror is a symbol of beauty, but also a powerful metaphor for vanity. Mirrors are the only place that you see yourself from the outside. We all have a constructed image of what we look like, and in the mirror, it collides with reality. Playing inside the ghostly crypt-like space, I filled one room with sleeping mirrors, and I called it my dormitorium. For me, vanity inevitably suggests mortality, since it's about trying to halt the march of time. People often look at these mirrors and think of them as death masks. In my oval mirrors, um, I was working with images of masks and obscured faces. I used crenellated drapery to magnify and distort the visage. I was trying to get almost a grotesque effect. Now, before I go on to the next exhibition, I want to introduce sartoriotypes. Um, this is a name I've invented for my prints. Um, and first, I want to say I love printmaking because it's instant gratification. And you can imagine when the door of that oven is closed, I'm on to the printing press. You know, I have to do something. So it's the real antithesis of glass casting. I wanted to work with the same themes of presence and absence. Um, and I wanted to try and use a completely different material or set of materials to achieve translucently, translucency. So I developed this printing technique where I would take old clothing and use them as printing plates, putting very, very fine fringe etching ink onto them and running them through a giant hydraulic press. And the process reveals a sort of secret history of the garments. Um, and it tells uh, or allows me to imagine a story of the wearer. In this case, you can see a coin had fallen through the pocket of the lining of the jacket. And so I imagine that this guy came up short when he was trying to buy something. <laughs> In this case, the dress anthropomorphized. A gathered seam became a spine, and the folds of cloth around the sides transformed into a rib cage. So my name for the prints, the sartoriotype, comes from a combination of sartorial, which means related to clothing, and type, which literally means impression. This is my printing press. It's, it's called the monster press. And it's um, manually operated. So that's how I stay fit. OK. The first time I exhibited the sartoriotypes was with the sculptures in 2007 in an exhibition titled Absence Adorned at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington. The exhibition space was completely different from the Romanesque basement in Prague, and I saw it as a stage. I used both cloth and sculptural curtains to divide the space. This is my audience. And um, I was asking them to come across a threshold into a different world, which was inhabited by my vacant costumes. I worked with the idea of the sculptures as actors in a suspended public performance. The viewers, in my mind, had, em had entered an abandoned tableau vivant. My hope was that the lifelike details that I worked so hard to preserve in the casting process would evoke a visceral response, and the viewer would take a role by inhabiting the empty dress. I 
I wanted viewers to take part in an imagined story, mine or theirs, it doesn't matter, suspended in a world where glass transforms our mundane world into a fragile drama. Mingling amidst the sculptures, the viewers participated in a play that in my mind was about both beauty and loss. In the context of this stage, the faces in the mirrors were like old photos of actors whose names and roles had long been forgotten. The sculptures became both actor and audience. And at certain points, I would go into the exhibition incognito, and I felt that the sculptures were actually watching the people. And perhaps that was the drama. The sartorio types became like theater posters or costumes for paper dolls. And that brought me full, back, full circle back to my earlier work for, with uh, marionettes and puppets. Okay, now you should fasten your seatbelts because um, <laughs> we're gonna go into my sketchbook. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is, I wanted to give you some insight or try to give you some insight into how an artist works. Um, I keep hundreds of sketchbooks and I gather images from really wide, wide references and um, somehow they mingle around in my mind and filter out into my work. Um, I found sketchbooks from when I was a high school student and inside of those sketchbooks, I found them in the basement maybe two and a half years ago, there were images of articulated dresses. So your mind is very consistent, um, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so I've paired inspirational images from the sketchbook with a sculpture related to that theme. And then I will read you my sometimes hilarious notations to myself. So here we go. Next to this image I wrote, Fabric conceals and reveals. Drapery obscures and illuminates. Here, nobly, nobility is a classical ideal. Drapery articulates the human figure. Folds of fabric rendered in marble speak of beauty and loss. Here I wrote, my sculptures echo the pristine white statues that survive from antiquity headless, armless remnants of a ruinous journey through time. Despite their classical origins, these pieces look incredibly modern to me, and I think it's their minimal installation. Here I have two sets of notes, one serious and one silly. So we'll start with the serious. Um, scarred fragments, imagination builds the rest. Each viewer completes their own sculpture and narrative. And uh, the second is um, a, a limerick I wrote. <laughs> <clears throat> there once was a statue in Rome. She sat on her ass on a throne. <laughs> 2,000 years later, a companion I made her, so now she won't sit all alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my debut as a poet. Um, <laughs> I often think in my studio, um, when I sculpt with fabric over these absent figures, I'm connected both to those ancient sculptures and to contemporary designers. Um, and this is an image of Madame Gris, who is my all-time hero. That's the finished image of the sculpture I was working on. Here I wrote, my practice is based on domestic skills. I make my own dresses. I use fabric, clothing, hairspray, irons, sewing needles, and hair dryers. I have developed a feminine vocabulary in the sculptor's studio. And here I'm actually working on the reclined, uh, reclining dress from the courtyard. In case you forgot what it looks like. <laughs> Here I wrote, fabric as an indication of wealth. <coughs> Irrational drapery defies gravity. Here I asked myself, 
Why is this man clutching velvet? Is he clinging to wealth and worldly distractions? So with this thought in mind, I wanted to talk about the beginning point, which is my choice of models. Um, and here is a model that I chose for a seated dress impression. Um, depending on what the sort of the impact that I want the final sculpture to have, I seek a different shape, size, or age model. In this sculpture, um, I used an older woman because I was thinking about this futility of trying hold on, to hold on to things that are impossible to hold on to. And in the end piece, I had her grasping at these masses of drapery that were just flowing away. So back to my sketchbook. Um, here I note, the fabric is used to convey spiritual wealth. In making this particular piece, um, I used three times the yardage when I sewed the dress. And then while composing, um, I let all of this excess fabric just tumble over the absent figure. It flowed onto the floor and was a literal excess. Um, in my mind, fabric can be as provocative and sumptuous as human flesh. Flesh is fabric. Fabric is flesh. Next to this image of St. Teresa, I wrote, the mutual dependence of wearer and garment, St. Teresa's dress. Feels her exaltation? Question mark. In exploring the expressive potential of fabric, I always land in sensuality. Now, finally, uh, the final entry from my sketchbook is um, a walk I took in the Czech countryside where I found these ja jackets just hanging there. They are isn't that creepy? <laughs> I know. They are um, just overcoats, and they're sort of makeshift scarecrows. Um, so I sort of directly translated that into glass. OK. Leaving the sketchbook behind, going back to the real world, um, or the semi-real world. Um, my most recent exhibition was at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. It's pretty local. And I adored this exhibition because it was the first time I had the opportunity to integrate my work into the classical collection of a museum. This large dress, which I made before I was invited to participate in the exhibition, was installed next, next to their sculpture, which is titled Undine Rising from the Waters. According to myth, an Undine is a sea spirit that can only take female form by tricking a male into marrying her. As long as he remains faithful, she can live on Earth. But if he is unfaithful, she kills him and goes back to the ocean. <laughs> I know, it makes divorce court look like a cakewalk, right? <laughs> um, so the amazing thing is that I had never seen their Undine rising from the water. And I still get chills when I see the similarity between the piece I had made in my studio and its companion in the museum. Um, many people comment to me on the ghostly qualities of my sculptures. And there's a real connection, I think, between the story of this disembodied female spirit and my empty dresses. At the other end of the hall, several busts I had made were installed next to their 18th century ideal busts. And you know, I felt my work added fragility to the existing themes represented by the sculptures Faith, Hope, and Charity. Downstairs in the entry hall to the museum, 
um, my reclining dress was placed next to a Roman sarcophagus from about 200 AD. And it was amazing to me that sort of across time, these sculptures were in communication and they were both speaking of human impermanence, mortality, the desire for immortality. And again, the similarities were almost creepy. Okay, now we go into forward explorations. Um, for so many years, I had worked with these universal themes, but only in a European context. And this changed in 2007 when I went to Japan to look at the same subject matter, but through a new cultural lens. Um, and in an obvious progression, my fascination with clothing took me directly to the kimono. I spent as much time as I could in a kimono, but that's not a particularly long time because it is incredibly uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody here has worn one, but it's unbelievable. I learned that under the kimono, the body is padded um, with pillows and constricted with wraps in an attempt to eliminate all curves, creating what is an ideal cylindrical shape for the display of the kimono's imagery. Um, and with my particular figure, this was a challenge. <laughs> I realized that how the kimono is worn parallels the relationship between Japanese individuals and their society. Putting on a kimono is literally about erasing the individual's identity and joining a, the group, which is, it's incredibly important to Japanese people, this concept of group. Um, and if you ask most Japanese what the most important thing they feel about themselves is, they'll say, the fact that I'm Japanese, which is completely opposite from sort of American individualist thinking. So perhaps the greatest aspect of my time in Kyoto was a collaborative project I did with master kimono maker Manami-san. And the first thing I realized, learned about making a kimono is that you start by drinking about five gallons of sake. <laughs> it, was, it was really challenging. Um, <laughs> but here I was, I was trying to figure out what image to put onto this ideal cylinder. Um, and it was really challenging for me. I missed my Baroque drapery. So I did what I love best. I took the cloth home and I worked with the raw fabric um, drawing on the floor and arranging and draping and you know, just trying to feel more comfortable. In the end, I decided to render an image of draped fabric onto the kimono. And of course, you know, I see myself as a type of minimalist, like a Baroque minimalist. So um, I wanted to use monochromatic shades of gray. Um, but this was a collaboration, and Manami-san convinced me that we should include a little bit of purple because he said it would enhance the sense of light and shadow. So this is our finished piggies. <laughs> and there's some purple and pink and green and everything. And I was, originally I was not thrilled with the colors. Um, but when two years later I got back to my studio in Prague and I started making some glass sculptures, I realized that the entire experience of making the kimono with Manami-san and these color choices that I was so against in the beginning had really influenced my work in a very, very deep, deep way. But um, I'll show you those sculptures later. But first, um, so. When I returned to Japan, I had over 250 kimonos in my suitcase. Um, yeah, and I, I had acquired a completely new palette, um, but I was a little bit lost. I didn't know what to do with it, and I struggled in my studio for two years trying to figure out, you know, what is it, what is it for? Um, and what I realized during this, you know, questioning period was that Cast glass is an appropriate material for commentary on a sort of European or Western extroverted society where dressing is all about expressing one's own personal geography. And you know, wearing a kimono was completely different. 
It's about erasing the particulars of your body and giving up individuality and joining a group. So I decided to work with clay, and this was a debut for me. I had never worked with clay. I might have made a coffee mug once at camp or something. But um, So working with clay, I felt it's earthiness paralleled the humility that I had observed in Japan. And the sensibility, somehow it just seemed right. And in my, in my first sculptures, I wanted to focus on all of the things that are celebrated in Japan. Subtlety, imperfection, you know, these are all components, you know, vibrant components of Japanese aesthetics. The opacity of the ceramic seemed to me to be a perfect um, match for the kimono because the kimono conceals. When I saw the first sculpture sort of standing at the other end of my studio, I was immediately reminded of um, the funerary um, sculptures from Xi'an, you know, the, the ceramic terracotta soldiers. Um, and you know, these funerary figures and the idea of burial. Um, and I started thinking, you know, a kimono in clay, the idea of wrapping oneself in the earth is a beautiful metaphor for human impermanence. It's the consumption of the body by the landscape. In taking fabric off of the body, this is when I was preparing my image for Manami-san, I began to see parallels between my drapery and the landscape. Where Western clothing charts the features of a body, a particular body, the kimono charts the features of a society, and drapery on the ground became a topography of the earth. So the, this is an ooh-ah experience I had in Japan. Um, that's what we always call them in art college. Um, I came upon these fishnets and I saw a confluence of drapery, landscape, and body. I spent hours with these nets. Um, I was drawing and sculpting on a scale larger than I had ever imagined was possible. And then I learned actually my favorite Japanese word, which is kichigai, and it means crazy person. <laughs> Because of the scale of the drapery, it had become a, become a borrowed landscape. This transient art, I, I documented it in, in photographs, but it really became inspiration for a new series of bas-relief sculptures. And here we are. It wasn't until several years after I made this piece that I realized that the color choice for this entire series of work was really inspired by my joint project with Manami-san. My collaboration and all of my experiences in Japan really became fodder for this new, new, new expression. In thinking about the landscape, it seemed natural to work literally um, with the earth so I made these pieces in cast ceramic. And I used a traditional cracked glaze, which I rubbed ink into to reference my fishnets. And in thinking about drapery as landscape, I realized it's just uh, almost intangible. I could transform it into an intangible drawing material, and I could capture the most ethereal natural experiences, like the sm smoke from incense. And there's the complete piece that that was a, a close-up of. And that sort of, you know, I realize there's no grand conclusion to my lecture because um, all of this work is still in process, you know. So I left those kimonos um, back in my studio, and this is the most recent casting I made at the factory. So, that is the end, or the until be, uh, and to be continued. <laughs> and now um, I wanted to open up the floor to questions. If anybody has questions or comments or anything like that, do not be shy. Yes? 
I, I can also repeat. I, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Oh. Um, there, this, the Smithsonian American Art uh, had a, an exhibit called Glass, Glass, Glass a few years ago at the Brentwood. It was like, you know, Chihuly and Marioni and uh, that, um, Mark, Richard Marquis. And um, your work is so different. I mean, there's nothing like it from like that show. Um, and I didn't know if you worked with or you know went to Seattle. Did yeah, yeah. Or worked so, with other artists. Yeah. Know. So the question is, um, my work is so different from sort of the the existing body of American glasswork and. Um, have I had any experience out in Seattle? And I actually, I went to Piltruck almost every summer. And um, I absolutely adore the American glassworking environment. And I think I've studied with Dante Marioni, with um, uh, not Rick, uh, Dick Marcus, but um, you know, a lot of these you know, big stars on the American scene, but somehow, I just have my completely unique aesthetic, and I have no idea where that comes from. <laughs> I mean, it's it's almost weird. <laughs> it is. It's really different. Well, you know, I think. Wait, let me think about it more because wh where would it come from? You know, my um, at art school, I was really I was taking foundry classes, and a lot of this you know, classical art, like at the academy, um, one of the big parts of my day was one-to-one -one figure drawing. And all of my education has been really extremely classical. And, you know, every time we go to Paris, we go to the um, Rodin Museum. And, you know, that's sort of my, my favorite period of art. And um, so I think it's that that I'm responding to, maybe more than my technical teachers. Uh, yeah. Oh, someone's by the microphone. Fantastic. Yes, good evening. I, uh, when I observed your statue upstairs, I assumed there was a facial feature to it. And I would like to ask you, do you ever intend on producing facial features? Mm. You know, it wouldn't be, you know, uh, not asking too much, but, you know, what do you think? <laughs> You want me to put a head on that lady? <laughs> I would like to, yes. Yeah, yes. Um, you know, it goes back to what I was saying about how my methods are really informed by my intention. And I'm not so interested in portraying an individual, a particular individual, but really the relationship between individuals and society. So, you know, I cut away the figure where there is no fabric. Or, or, or clothing, and um, so, you know, unless I was to do a burqa or a, you know, a wedding gown with a veil or something, you know, I, I probably wouldn't work with the facial features. But, sort of as a consolation prize, I did make those mirrors, you know, and they have the faces. So. <laughs> oh, 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 I would like to also ask, uh, what about putting your own face on one or two of them? My own, I do, I have taken, I've posed for two of the body molds and a series of the images for the mirrors. So I have, there is some aspect of self-portrait in all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh-oh. Of all the pieces I've done, is there one that's a particular favorite? Um, wow. I don't think so. <laughs> it's a really, sorry. Oh, uh, well, I do have to say, the one upstairs, you know, all, all kidding is, but I'm a little concerned about her because I actually think she's getting spoiled with all of this attention. I mean, she has a par party in her honor tomorrow night, so you know, I don't know. She, her ego is going to, you know, get out of control. <laughs> yes. What do you use to stiffen and preserve the fabric? Yes. This is onto my secret technology, which is this is a great question. Um, hairspray. I use hairspray to stiffen the fabric before I paint it with hot wax. Um, you know, and I tried everything. I was trying fancy things, complicated things. Um, and then, you know, 
it must have been on like a, a New Jersey mall day when I was looking around and you know I saw all this you know frozen hair hair frozen in space and I thought wait a minute what about hairspray <laughs> so yeah hairspray I know it's part of my feminine studio vocabulary <laughs> yes I have a um, structural question. Yes. It seems like the vertical pieces, three sections, but the horizontal pieces looked like they were one piece to me. Is that, did I see it right? No, you didn't. How'd you um, hide that from me? I hide um, the, the, sometimes I hide the um, cut lines. They're actually in three or sometimes four pieces mm -hmm. also. I'll go look. <laughs> yes? How are you getting the face on your mirror? Ah, how am I getting the face on the mirrors? Um, it's actually the same technology that's used to engrave um, burial stones, headstones in the Czech Republic. It's a little morbid, but um, it is a photo transfer process, and you transfer the photograph onto a gelatinous um, sandblasting resist. And then you use sand, and the sand engraves the image into the glass. Another man by the microphone. Yeah, hi. hi. Um, thank you. It's been one wonderfully inspirational to watch this. Uh, uh, and I'm not particularly into art, but I found this really inspirational. Um, I'm a coach, so one of the things sports, I'm really sports. No, no. I'm uh, executive and life coach oh, uh, okay. from London. And uh, what what I'm curious uh, to, to ask you is uh, your clip people telling you impossible doesn't stop you uh, so I'm, I'm I'm wondering what if you were to sum up what your, were your key characteristics or, or, or yeah. kind of mindsets that enable you to still achieve what others see as impossible yes. what do you say that was about you and, and, and where did that come from and, and did you always have that the three yeah. questions in one there okay so the characteristics that make me do things that people yeah. say yeah, are, yeah, totally. are impossible yeah. Yeah. that's um, stubbornness and <laughs> arrogance yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just about equal parts. Yeah. Um, whenever somebody says to me something's impossible, I'm like, they are so wrong. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. totally do that. Yeah. Um, and where do the characteristics come from? I think stubbornness comes from my dad. Um, and arrogance, I just kind of picked up on my way. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> OK, great. And um, I'm not really arrogant. Yeah. That was a joke. <laughs> Um, but I am stubborn. I am really stubborn. Yeah. Um, my husband is here, and he can. The, yeah, yeah, the question was to him um, as well, actually. <laughs> and um, so then, what was the third part of the question again? Uh, uh, that, that, you know, I can't remember. But yeah, uh, uh, yeah it's, you know, I'm just curious to see how you you, you, know, you go beyond the impossible. Me, yeah, when someone tells me something's impossible, I think they might be right, mm. but they might be wrong. And so if I give it my best shot and try, you know, over and over again, um, we'll find out, yeah. you know. So it's kind of like I want to, I have one theory, they have the other theory, and I kind of want to see where the truth lies. Yeah, sure. Because I was fascinated with the, uh, the time you had to wait, the, those kind of 80-day uh, wait. Oh, yeah. And you may, the, the failure rate may still be 50%, but that yeah. doesn't, you know, it doesn't discourage you. You're, you're right. You're you know what? Actually, we both might be right because it's half, possible and half yeah, impossible yeah. with all those failures, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 great. <laughs> Don't tell the guys at the factory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes? Uh, what drew you really into the world of art? My question comes more about when you're younger and all, and all that, like, mm. you, you have certain dreams, but what actually made you follow and pursue the career of, of, of the arts? Um, my incredibly bad math skills would be step one. Basically, um, I have a narrow range of excellence. Um, <laughs> I think there's not a lot of other careers that are open to me. I'm insanely dyslexic, so um, you know, left, right, up, down, it's bad. I can't even drive. And um, you know, I think that it's sort of in this realm, like I can see everything in my mind. Like right now, I know in our house, 
where everything is. So I think the, my power of visualization is maybe more developed than an average person. And so I think I just feel so comfortable. And I love to make things. You know, I love working with my hands and all of that. I knit sweaters and I cook and I'm always doing something with my hands. And um, I think those two things combined, you know, it just seemed to be a natural fit. And I love going to museums. I've always, since I was a kid, my mom always tells a story. She took me to the um, Joseph Boys retrospective um, at the Guggenheim in New York. And, you know, I was like this little kid marching around and I was like, what is this smelly pile of tar, you know? And I was like six years old. So I grew up in New York City really embroiled in this, in this environment, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a man standing by the microphone. There, there is. Um, I'm a former curator in American history. And in the 60s, um, I was pleased. Actually, while in pharmacy school, I used to go up to Rhode Island. I'm a New Yorker. Mm. Um, and um, knew a number of the artists and actually helped them with some of the uh, new processes. Um, uh, a, a quick story is one of them, a woman was working in latex, a relatively new material, and she got onto Freud and teeth and she did all these latex sculptures on teeth. As a curator in the medical sciences, I had this exhibit on a modern uh, dental sculpture. Uh, the uh, American Dental Association gave me for a reception, of course, a uh, nice check and every, everything. And then when they came there, they were mortified, absolutely <laughs> mortified of this thing. and. I got a bit of trouble with the castle. They were not expecting this sort of thing. But the, the, the question to you is, I, I personally have witnessed a number of the RISD students and they're branching out into new mediums and, and, and materials. Um, and I find an incredible parallel from artists, students that I knew 40 years ago, and your uh, a view of the world, so to speak, aha mm -hmm. moments. Yes. Uh, could you give a few comments on sure. your RISD experience? Sure. Um, actually, the big secret is I only have a BFA. So I went to RISD for undergraduate school, and I never went back to school. You know, And I really feel that it was an amazing education. Um, the the combined development of technical, it's a Bauhaus style education, so it's combining technical skills, um, an understanding of sort of the, I don't want to say like supremacy of materials, but the qualities that are imbued inside of a material and what the expressive potential of that material is because of its qualities. And um, then of course the technical, I mean we had you know studios all the time, bronze casting, welding, glass blowing, glass casting, um, architectural drawing. Um, and I think that it is an amazing education. And when I got to, uh, Bruce Chow was my main um, instructor, and he had a very intellectual approach on how to use glass. And he had a series of assignments for the students like um, a glass vessel. And we were supposed to take that. We had one week, year, week, it was one week of research, and then we came back with all of our notes and our research, and then a second week of developing the idea of the project, and then the third week of actually making the project. And we did that exercise over and over and over again with different sort of abstract you know, sentences like that. And I think that really gave me the ability to think through a material and kind of capture its potentials to their best, and also to be a real stickler for craftsmanship. Because mm -hmm. that's one thing I think that not many schools uh, focus on. And I often think, you know, I've come up with this phrase that, like, aesthetics are your vocabulary, and craftsmanship are the words that build aesthetics. And if you have a badly made image, it would be as if I was or a badly made sculpture would be as if I was standing up here speaking gibberish. You know, you can't get the message across. Um, so I think that it, it is an incredible education. 
And I begged them not to graduate me my senior year. I was like, just one more year. I loved school. I loved it. The uh, uh, degrees disappear. I'm an hour university professor. And uh, one of the things my professors said to me in the 60s is that once you leave here, uh, doesn't matter what's up on the wall or what grades you've got, it's, it's you and you're there. Mm. And uh, thank you, I, it's the RISD I knew in the 60s. <laughs> yes. Could you talk about or share any thoughts you had about um, or possible experimentation with color glass? Colored glass, um, my thoughts or possible experimentations with colored glass. Well, um, the new, the abstract drapery pieces that I'm making right now are actually all in colored glass. Um, and it's been actually a treat to work in colored glass. What I'm working with is um, the intensity of color changes with the thickness of the glass. Um, so as I work with the drapery, you know, the, the high points in the valleys, I'm actually working, it's almost like watercolor, you know, a, a darker part and the, is thicker and then a, a thinner part is lighter. And so that's really, I'm sort of learning the vocabulary of color now. Yes? With that 50% failure rate, what is the biggest problem? Like, do you have a, you know, is there something that keeps happening in the kiln or is there? I know what the variety? problem is. It's the guys at the factory. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> They keep spitting in my molds or something. I don't know what it is. No, <laughs> it's actually the owner of the factory said, you know, when I was like, why is this not working? And he was like, Karen, Karen, you don't ask why this is not working. You ask why all the other pieces worked. Um, so you know, that's Czech pessimism though, you know. You know. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard. Like, I, I know what makes my sculptures hard is in the annealing, what's happening is glass, when it's hot, like every material, it's expanded. And the exterior layer is cooling and shrinking around the expanded interior layer. So like when I have the body of the dress and then a drapery flange is going off, the complexity of that curve and how the glass is cooling is, as they say, catastrophic. So, you know, it, it's a really, I'm asking a lot of the material, but, you know, that's my nature. So, yes? Along the same lines, technically, do you use sprues to get the bubbles out? Yes. Like yes, casting. absolutely. Is same as bronze, same as bronze. And this is another weird thing. The guys at the factory, you know, because they were used to these really large open face molds, um, they didn't need any sprues. You know, and so the first castings came out and they, you know, looked horrible. They were all filled with bubbles and everything. And I was like, well, we have to put sprues. And they were like, no, 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 we don't, we don't. And I was like, yeah, 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 we do, we do, you know. And <laughs> that's really like the nature of our relationship. And I'm like, just try the sprues. And they're like, no. And I'm like, come on, please try the sprues. And uh, <laughs> so eventually we tried the sprues and it worked. <laughs> so that's sort of, that's what I've been doing for 11 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yes, a woman by the microphone. Hi. <laughs> okay, it's kind of high. Um, in your line of doing the dresses, are you considering, um, like you went to Japan, are you considering any other global locations or perhaps more historical costumes? Like, what are your thoughts going in? Like, are you going to continue down that route and which way do you plan to go? Yep. Um, okay, so I sort of see three, I always t t tend to see three paths. Um, all global locations are continuously under consideration um, <laughs> because I love to travel. Um, but the, so right now what I'm working on are the drapery abstractions, the kimonos inspired by the Japanese experience. And that's really, I mean, I've literally, Monday I start at a ceramic residency in the Netherlands. Those pieces I showed were small scale pieces, but I want to work full scale. Um, so Monday I'm starting that. And, um, oh, the other, oh. So um, I'm also working on a show that I would love to be a traveling show in the United States of a group of odalisque figures. Um, so, you know, and I'm thinking of 
building an environment of, you know, inside of a harem with all of these rich draperies and fabrics and these reclining women. So that's sort of the three directions I'm working right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Somebody's heading towards the microphone. Hello. Hello. Clearly, you've had some art ooh ah moments. Yes. And when you were working with your comrades in the Czech Republic, what was it like when they had an ooh ah moment about what you were up to? That's a great question, actually. Um, well, I've had comments like this from the guys at the factory. Your work is so ugly that it's become beautiful again. <laughs> that was a highlight. Um, <laughs> um, no, there, there have been a few ooh ah moments. You know, um, the, some one of the one of the other Czech artists really prominent in the field was like, your work is so funny. Um, you know, like the idea of a see-through dress, haha. -ha. And I was like, your work's funny too. Um, <laughs> um, but in the factory, I think there might have been a couple of times. The guys are, you know, Czech society, think America, 1950s. Like, the guys are tough, you know. Um, and what they love to do when I go up there is um, point out all the things that I might have done wrong. You know, they're like, well, you know, how this underpart goes there, you know, I'm not sure that's quite, you know, how it should be. Maybe you should think about this. But they're great. I mean, we do, I think they do ultimately like the work now. Um, and none of them have an art background. So I think actually sort of liking the work is, that's their maximum, you know. Um, but they do like it. Um, and we do have fun. So I think that's the, that's the main thing. Do, do other artists work there now? Do stuff with them? Um, sometimes people come and go. You know, they really focus on architectural projects. Um, right now, you know, the big thing is um, all the money, you know, and the Czechs are hilarious because it's a developing, like, a new economy. They're like, all the money's in the Middle East. Um, we're casting the inside chamber of the sultans, something or another, and, you know, and so they're really, um, they're, more driven towards these, um, might I say, like financially lucrative projects, um, you know, and that's that's reality also. You know, it, it's it's a factory which is a business, and so they have to think about how to function. You know, so yep. Ah yes. Yeah. Just a pragmatic question, sure. I guess. Um, in the beginning, when you started making these glass dresses, I know you were on a Fulbright. But it just occurred to me they must be pretty expensive to make. Yes, they are. Um, and so the Fulbright year was good. That was funded by the grant. And then there was, it took about two and a half years to make the next show, or two and a half, three years. And um, that was funded by credit card debt. Wow. So <laughs> MasterCard, so you really Visa. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I'm crazy, so um, it's easy to believe in yourself when you have a very limited sense of reality. Um, and <laughs> and um, my husband, at one point I was working in the studio, and I was working on a piece. I didn't show a picture tonight, but it was an A-frame dress. And I pay for everything at the factory by the kilo, right? And so I had made this dress where the body was straight in the middle, and the dress went out like this. And he's like, wow, Karen, that's great. Um, you might want to think about <laughs> bringing the sides in a little bit. And I was like, Stephen, you cannot try to invade my mind and take over my artistic vision like this, you know? Um, <laughs> and he said, well, um, you know, it's going to be really expensive. And I was like, listen, you know, this is not about money and not money and all this stuff. And so then he was like, OK. You know, he left. He was like, OK, just let her do her thing. And um, I got the bill for that piece. From the, and I just started crying. I had, a, you know, no money. So that was bad. But, and then I started listening to Steve a little bit more. <laughs> because he is my um, husband, but he is also my manager. And he is sort of the, we always say we have completely non-overlapping skill sets. So, 
anything impractical, that's my department, and then all of the practical and sound-minded stuff, that's his department. Okay. We have exhausted all of the questions. And 648.